Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the lecture for today. Today's lecture is called Mendel and Heredity. So it's all about how parents pass on traits to their offspring. We're trying to answer that question, how does a trait like sickle cell anemia skip one or more generation, generations? Here we go. Um, so we're going to apply concepts of statistics and probability to explain the variation and distribution of expressed traits in a population. And this is high school life science standard 3.3. Three. Four questions we're going to be answering. What is heredity? What did Mendel do? What are the two laws he discovered? And then how do some traits such as sickle cell anemia skip one or more generation? All right, let's get started. So what is heredity? Well, heredity is the study of how traits are passed on from one generation to the next. And this is a, a pedigree chart which shows how a trait gets passed on. So if you uh, get into heredity, maybe become a genetic counselor or even a dog breeder, right? They'll use these pedigree charts to help them see how a trait is passed on and then make predictions about what the offspring would be like. Now, what are traits? Traits are characteristics that are inherited. For example, the ability to roll your tongue, the hairline, right? this famous one it comes down is called the widow's beak. Whether your earlobes are hanging free or if they're attached to the to your side of your um, face, lots of different things are traits. Anything that can be inherited. And so our question is, how do these traits get passed on to the offspring? Now, genetics is the study of inheritance and the variation in organisms. And the father of modern genetics, the person who really first started this study, is Gregor Mendel. Now, Gregor Mendel uh, grew up in Austria, and in 1843, he entered a monastery, and he was in charge of the garden. So he was growing fruits and vegetables for the, the monks living at the monastery. And so he was really interested in science and plants. And so when he was old enough, he uh, was sent to the University of Vienna to study math and science. And when he came back, he returned to the monastery. He decided to go and stay at the monastery. And he was again in charge of the gardens. But, you know, having uh, been a scientist and a mathematician, at the university, he decided to apply that, that statistics to the study of plants in his garden, and he happened to pick the pea plant. Uh, let's stop for a moment. Here's three questions. Um, please press pause, and why don't you take a couple of minutes, answer these questions, and then we'll check your answers. Okay, let's check your answers. Number one, heredity is the study of how traits are passed on from one generation to the next. Number two, traits are physical characteristics that are inherited. And number three, genetics is the study of inheritance and variation in organisms. All right, so hopefully you got those. Um, you can study them and review them for the quiz. Okay. So Mendel did these experiments with pea plants. Now, let's see how make sure you know about pea plants. So you're probably familiar with the little green peas, the little vegetable that we eat. Well, they're actually the seed that come out of the pea pod. And the pod grows on these vines um, of the pea plants. And pea plants, what he noticed is uh, uh, they come in a variety of traits, but they only have in two variations. So example, the trait for flower color, you only had purple or white flowers. Um, and he saw that for all these other traits, they only came in two variations or two forms. And he did a bunch of different experiments. Um, well, here, watch this little video clip.
Right, so that gives a little overview of his experience, but let me point out some things. So, he realized that the sperm and egg contains something that determines a physical trait. We call those genes. Um, so, for example, there is a gene for flower color. The second thing he realized is that these genes come in different forms. We call them alleles. For example, there's an allele for purple and an allele for white flower. Okay, so this gene is made of two alleles, one from either parent. And so there's three possible combinations, right? You can get a purple from mom and a purple from dad. You can get a white from mom and a white from dad. Or you could get a purple from mom and a white from dad, or a white from dad and a purple from mom. And then he realized that one allele which he called the dominant, completely masks the other, which he called the recessive, right? And this is actually the key for how traits can skip generations. It only works if one is dominant over the recessive, right? The purple is dominant over the white. So the white is recessive and the purple is dominant. That's oftentimes how you can tell uh, from a pedigree chart, if it's a dominant trait or a recessive trait, right? The, it's the recessive one that can disappear and then reappear. So, right, the white gets masked by the purple. Now, so these ideas led to Mendel's first law of inheritance, which he called the principle of dominance, which says, number one, genes are made up of two alleles. Alleles come in two forms, dominant and recessive, and dominant allele masks the recessive allele. Now, in order to, right, he, so these are great ideas, and it's called a hypothesis, his principle of dominance, but he had to now test it um, with experiments. That's what scientists do. And so he had to have some kind of way to notate alleles and and genes and dominance and recessives. So he came up with a system for keeping track of the alleles. And he did this by using letters. And so he would he decided that he would use the first letter of the dominant allele. So since for flowers, purple is dominant, he used P's for flower color. And then he had to distinguish between dominant and recessive. So he used a capital letter for symbolizing the dominant allele, right? And then he used a lowercase letter to symbolize the recessive allele, right? So uppercase P for purple flowers, lowercase P for white flowers. And now because they res the recessive trait could disappear and reappear, each organism must have two alleles for a trait, right? That's how he figured out that there had to be two because there had to be a way for the white to be masked. So for example, you could get two dominant alleles, right? A dominant P for mom and a dominant P from dad. And so he had to give that a name, right? He had to come up with a vocabulary to, to express these ideas. So when the two alleles were the same, he decided to use the word homozygous, right? Homo means same. And zygous refers to zygote, which is what you get when a sperm fertilizes an egg, right? Sperm fertilizes egg, and you get a zygote. 
And so the thinking is, if you have two of the same in the zygote, it would be a homozygous. And then because they're both dominant, he called it dominant. So homozygous dominant. And of course, the flower color would be purple, right? Because this one says purple, this one says purple, so the flower would be purple. The other alternative, you could have two recessive alleles, right? A recessive P from mom, a recessive P from dad. Well, again, they were the same, so he would he called those homozygous, right? Again, homo means same. And this time, they are not dominant, they're recessive. So we call them homozygous recessive. And of course, right, it says the recessive says white flower. The other one's white flower, so you get a white flower. Now, the third possibility is you have one of each, right? Either a dominant from mom and a recessive from dad, or the dominant from mom and the recessive from dad. Whichever one, you have one of each. Now, that's not homozygous, right? That is called heterozygous. Hetero means other. And again, zygous is the result from the sperm and eggs. And notice, you don't have to say dominant or recessive because heterozygous means you have both of them. Now, what flower color is this genotype going to give? Right? Remember that the dominant masks the recessive. So you won't have purple. You'll, I'm uh, sorry, you won't have white. You'll have purple. Right? Because the purple allele masks the white allele. So the flower would be purple. Whew. Makes sense? I know. One last idea. Genotype and phenotype. So, <clears throat> he had to have a way to describe the two alleles that make up a gene, right? Uppercase P, uppercase P, right? Homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and he called those the genotypes. Should be easy to remember. Genotype tells you the type of genes, right? The uppercase, 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 lowercase, right? Tells you the alleles. And then the physical appearance, whether it's purple or white, that he, he called the phenotype. Uh, easy to remember. Again, phenotype tells you the type of physical appearance, right? Whether it's purple or white. Okay, let's stop for a moment. Um, we've got a whole bunch of new vocabulary words. Let's make sure you understand them. Here are some fill in the blanks. Here's a word bank. Here are one, two, three, four, five. Um, sentences for you to complete. Go ahead and pause the narration, pause the playback, fill in your blanks, and then we'll go over the answers together. All right, let's check your answers. The different forms of a gene are called alleles. Number two, the dominant allele masks the recessive allele. Number three, the phenotype describes the physical trait that a gene codes for. Number four, the genotype represents the two alleles that make up a gene. And number five, when the genotype is made up of two of the same alleles, it is called homozygous. All right, make sure you uh, review those, make sure you study those for the quiz. Um, it'd be a great way to prepare. All right. Okay, so he realized that the two alleles separate when sperm and egg are made, All right? So let's say the father is homozygous dominant. When the father goes, cells go through meiosis, right? During anaphase, when they separate, right? Um, 
they're going to end up in different sperm. And the same thing if you're heterozygous, and the same thing if you're homozygous recessive. The point is that the alleles separate. <clears throat> so that each sperm or egg has only one allele for each gene. And this led to Mendel to form the law of segregation, which says that two alleles for each gene separate during the formation of gametes, right, sperm and eggs. Now, this occurs for all genes at the same time, right? So the genes, the alleles for flower color, seed color, the position of the flower, whether the, the texture of the seed, the color of the pod, the texture of the pod, uh, the, the height of the plant, and then thousands and thousands of other traits. So for each one, the alleles separate. So each gamete, each sperm or egg, only has one copy of each allele. Finally, Mendel realized that the alleles for one trait separate independent of the alleles for the other traits. So, what this this is kind of the same idea, but so if you have a purple, yellow, purple flower, yellow seeds, um, but it's it's also got the white and the green. Are purple and yellow always going to go together, and white and uh, green always going to go together, or can you get a purple and green and a white with yellow, right? And so he realized that because one allele for each trait goes in each sperm, right, it can happen this way, or it could happen the other way. So yes, you could get the purple with the green, or the white with the yellow, right? So they they the way that the alleles sort, it doesn't depend on the other one, right? Or another way to think about it, the dominants don't have to stay together. You can get a dominant and a recessive. And he called that the law of independent assortment, right? That the way that the alleles sort is independent of the other ones, right? So you can get different alleles for different genes, and they separate independent of each other. So you could get purple with green with ax, uh, uh, anyway, right? Dominant with recessive, recessive. You can get all different kinds of combinations. An infinite, well, not an infinite number, but there are so many possible combinations. And of course, this explains why two parents can have kids that are so different from each other, right? Just look at you and your siblings. You don't look the same. And that's because each one of you is a unique combination of alleles from each of your parents. Even twins aren't exactly the same. 
Anyway, the point is there are many possible combinations, lots of genetic variation. All right, let's stop here for self-check number three. Go ahead and take about five minutes, fill in the blanks, and then we'll come back and check your answers. All right, let's check your answers. Each sperm and eggs have one allele for each gene. Number two, the law of independent assortment states that the alleles for the different genes separate independently of each other. And number three, the law of segregation states that the two alleles for each gene separate during the formation of gametes. All right, now people um, confuse these very easily, but there's a very simple way to tell them apart. If you notice, they both talk about the genes separating, right? Uh, but this one has the word independent in it, right? So the law of independent assortment is the idea that they separate, but that they separate independently of each other. That's the difference, right? The law of segregation, segregation means to separate, right? Or sort things and, and put them into different groups. So the law of segregation just talks about them separating, okay? So if the word independent is in there, it's independent assortment. If it's just about separating, it's segregation, okay? A simple way to tell them apart. All right, now here, this is the tricky one. The possible gametes for a cell with the genotype heterozygous purple, heterozygous tall are, so now you gotta think, you're gonna have one of each letter. So what are the possibilities? Well, you can get a big P with a big T. What else could you get? A little P with a little T. But remember, they separate independent of each other. So you could also get a big P with a little t, and you could also get a little p with a big t, right? See how much variation there can be? All right, that's the end of, this, of the lecture. Uh, hopefully you understand everything. If not, you can go back and review it as many times as you want. And then to prove to me that you understand these basic concepts, you're going to complete the arcade game assignment. All right. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or if you have any problems. Um, just email me through Schoology and I'll get back to you as quick as I can.